Hi, and welcome to the Macro Show. We talk macro, and you wonder, can deposit rates really go negative? Well, the answer is they can. I'm not sure if they will, but we'll talk about the big mistake Fed Chair Powell can make that could send deposit rates negative and make even things worse. We've got some great economic data to look at with everyone talking about how the CPI is headed to 3% plus. Well, we're gonna look at that and say, is this even possible? You're gonna be the judge. Plus, we're gonna find out some other stuff in the economic data that talks about the liquidity trap. We got bond auctions. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter. Thanks for joining me today. And let's start out with the headline question. Can deposit rates actually go negative? And now we gotta come back to this SLR rule. I know you might be getting tired of it, but I think a decision on this is gonna come in the next, well, it's gonna to have to because it expires on March 31st. So let's understand what the SLR rule did. It allowed banks to expand their balance sheet. What does that mean? Take on more deposits because the post great financial crisis rules, the Basel three banking regulation says, Hey banks, we're going to, you can expand them, but not real fast and not a whole lot. So that's the first thing that's going to happen. Now, quantitative easing eats bank deposits. Now, a lot of people think it's just the opposite, that quantitative easing creates bank deposits. It does not create bank deposits, it eats them. It's like a Pac-Man of bank deposits, it chews them up. Now, where are these bank deposits gonna be coming from? Well, it appears now that we have the Senate and the House passing the Biden stimulus plan. It seems as if it's going to be signed. There should be nothing keeping Biden from signing it. And so that will go into effect. And then over the next week or two, deposits will start to come in to bank accounts. And what do we know historically that one third of all stimulus checks are saved. Recent surveys actually show 40% of this one is gonna be saved due to economic uncertainty. So now all of a sudden you have bank balance sheets starting to expand. Now, if the Fed does not actually allow this to happen, if they, if they do not extend the SLR exemption, well, the banks are gonna have a problem what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to take deposit rates negative. They're going to do this on large balances. They've already started preparing some of their big customers. And what they will do to small customers, people like us, is it will shift us into money market accounts because the banks are not going to be allowed to expand their, their balance sheets enough to handle all of the, the money coming from stimulus. So they have to get money off their balance sheet. Why well, do you do that? You shove people in a money market. So you have potentially negative deposit rates for large investors. And then you have negative T-bill rates as there's too much money chasing short-term T-bills, which could either force the Fed into doing a operation twist that we talked about a few days ago, or, well, driving the whole front of the curve negative and causing major pandemonium in the market, which would, of course, drive the yield curve all the way on the back end slamming down as panic hits the markets because you can't have a negative money market rate well you could you're not supposed to so is it possible that deposit rates can go negative and the answer is yes if the fed does not extend this slr exemption and so all of a sudden the, start, the picture becomes really clear right you you say okay they they put the xlr exemption in place to do what allow the banks to expand their balance sheet so that way, money coming in from stimulus could be absorbed by the banks. Now, the Fed is doing a lot of quantitative easing. What do they need? Bank balance sheets to expand so they can chew it up via the reserve swap. So banks take those new deposits, buy treasury securities, which are turn create bank reserves, and then the Fed swaps them. So if the Fed doesn't extend the SLR exemption, it also means quantitative easing, as we know it, is going to have to shrink perhaps even go away. And what did Fed Chair Powell say recently? He said the thing is he is watching the most is a labor force participation rate. And regardless of what else goes on until the labor force participation rate gets back up at a normal level, he's not going to stop. And what we know, because we already did the research on this, is that quantitative easing, the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet, is a negative, has a negative impact on the labor, labor force participation rate. Meaning Powell's going to have to plan on doing QE for a couple more years or more, which means he's boxing the corner. He's either going to have to extend the SLR exemption or come up with something new to allow the banks to expand their balance sheets or by regular, because by regulation, the banks can't, they can only absorb so much of this. And there you go. So it is entirely possible we could see it, but I'm assuming 
that there isn't going to be a major uh, policy mistake by the Fed. I'm, my presumption is they are waiting until Biden signs off on the stimulus, which should be before the next FOMC meeting press conference, which is on the 17th of next week, where Powell then announces it and says, oh, by the way, we're going to do this, even though everyone's telling us not to, but we kind of have to do it. And away we go. That's what I expect. All right. So let's talk about the CPI, uh, which is really interesting because a lot of people were expecting a big problem. Actually, you know what? Let's look at the economic data first. I'm really excited about the CPI thing. I, if, if you can't tell, I'm really looking forward to it. Let's start out with the National Federation Independent Business, Small Business Optimist. Now went up a little bit from 95 to, to 95.8, saying, that, hey, small businesses are a little more optimistic in February. But are they really that more optimistic? Well, considering at the pandemic lows are at 90.9, we're at 95.8. And if you start zooming this thing out a bit, what you realize, yeah, they're not that optimistic about the situation at all. Only marginally more optimistic. Now we get into the Red Book, same store weekly retail sales. Now the year over year number is great, plus 8%. You can't, you cannot knock that. But how about the month over month? We're now at eight straight weeks of negative, and this is a minus 18%, minus 18.1. This is the largest monthly drop in the history going back to 2005. We've never seen this. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. Why is there such a big drop? Is this a misprint? I did check around, didn't find any evidence of that. Is this a bigger story of what's going on with the consumer? Hang on to that thought. How about the three-year note auction? Market was really nervous going into this, and what happened? Had the highest bid to cover in six last six months, meaning there were more bids to cover the offer than there were in the last six months. Everybody showed up to, bar, to, to, to buy government debt, particularly the dealers, and why would they? Well, because there's a huge demand for on the front end of the curve because the Fed's buying a bunch of three-year treasury notes and the banks need them. Look at the low yield at 0.08%, giving you an indicator just how strong the demand was for this auction. Now, you know, and that alleviated a lot of the concerns going into today's tenure auction because a lot of people thought that to, there was going to be a failed auction. Again, after, you know, coming back from that seven year note uh, last month. Now, speaking of that, I, remember I, I kind of said that I thought it had to do with the Fedwire situation and, and foreign bidders not be able to put in their offering. It's starting to appear that because there's no evidence based on the three years so far that there's any problems. And we already know because you probably look, there's no problems with the 10 year. So it was probably had to do with the Fedwire system going down. How about consumer price index out of China? Look at that negative. 0.2% still deflationary. Meanwhile, producer prices are up plus 1.7%. It's called squeeze at the margin. So producers are exporting or are sending in inflation out of the factory and being unable to pass it on to the consumers. That is not good. All right, let's move into mortgage applications down 1.3% from last week. They're, these things are down pretty big off their highs. What this is an indication is Borrowers are rejecting higher interest rates. If they were able to absorb the higher interest rates, you would not see declines in mortgage applications. And just to give you an indication, we'll zoom in here on the one-year chart, and you can see they've been coming down, 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 down as rates go up, up, up. And that is a sign of a liquidity trap. If you were seeing inflation, then, and then homeowners and potential borrowers could absorb those higher rates as their incomes go up. Let's take a look at this consumer price index. Now the headline CPI up 1.7%. What's more interesting, the core CPI virtually flat on the month up 0.1, but decelerated disinflation here down to 1.3%. And probably one of the biggest things that I'm not sure the market even noticed was that real earnings, when you see real, think inflation adjusted earnings month over month, it's down 1%. Now that is pretty bad. It should, you should not see that. You know, we're, we're talking about how, hey, consumers have all this extra money. Well, what now is what it's saying is due to inflation, consumers have less money. So hmm, all of a sudden you start to think, well, maybe there's something to do with that Red Book weekly retail sales report. Maybe they're not too far from the truth. Well, let's dig, let's dig into CPI because there's a lot of people out there predicting CPI is going to two, 3% and really, we kind of know this isn't true. So let's start out with this chart here. We have the consumer price index 
and I've got the monetary base inverted. And what you can see is while the consumer price index swings around, it eventually comes back to roost with the monetary base. Why? Because we're in a liquidity trap. And what that means is higher prices are ultimately rejected by consumers. And what's a good evidence of price rejection? Oh, hey, retail sales down, uh, week, uh, weekly retail sales down 18%. That tells you that it, the consumers are not chasing these higher prices. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have higher prices. It just means they're not sustainable. And as demand goes away, retailers and wholesalers will eventually lower their prices. Now, let's go on and let's take out food and energy. This is a core CPI. And this is the one that actually is going down. And when you look at the shape, you're like, wow, it looks like the monetary base inverted. Well, it certainly does. And it's following the monetary base lower. So what does that tell us is what I've been talking about on the show a long time is quantitative easing is disinflationary and can be, depending on the size and scope, outright deflationary. Well, here you see it. The core CPI is at 1.3%. The monetary base is saying, hey, you're going lower. And it, meanwhile, inflation is saying, hey, core is going way up. And no, it does not appear that that's the case at all. Because again, you're back to this liquidity trap. You know, you have higher prices being unable to be absorbed by consumers. Now think about, let's go back to the base CPI. What does this have that the core doesn't? Food and energy. What are two things that consumers have to consume? Food and energy. So if you drive up I want you to think about this. If you drive up consumer prices or food and energy prices, what does that mean? In a, in a zero sum game where there's not enough money because there's a liquidity trap for everything and you drive up something that the consumers must spend money on, they have to pay the higher energy costs, they have to pay the higher food costs, what does that mean? Oh, lower discretionary spending, right? And suddenly that red book print, as bad as it is, starts to make sense. Now, hopefully, it's not, it, that was just a one-off report. If it's not, it's going to be really ugly out there. Let's continue on. Now, we know the monetary base, because of QE, just falls cash assets at banks. As cash assets at banks rises, the Fed, they're converted into reserves, and then, they're, and then the Fed chews them up with QE. So here I've got cash assets at all commercial banks inverted, showing that, hey, core inflation is actually headed lower. It's likely to head lower, not higher. Not at all. Let's continue on. And what does that spell for velocity of money or how often money is used in a transaction in a given period of time? Well, it suggests that the velocity of money is headed lower. And the core CPI confirms that. It's not what the market is expecting. The market's looking for inflation and it believes that when you reopen the economy, money is going to start moving around. Well, it's not because it's being tied up by the Fed in the banking system. And then here you see cash assets inverted against the velocity of money. It's saying the velocity is going to stay low and be low, again, due to the disinflationary effects of quantitative easing. And this is something that's being completely overlooked by the market right now. Let's go on. And the question becomes is who's right? Is the CPI right or the core right? Well, my friends, the core is right. You can see that the CPI will move up and around the core, but when the core is headed lower, that eventually the CPI will follow it. So then the next question we should ask is, well, what's driving? If we, if we know the core is being driven by the Fed and the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet through quantitative easing, then why is core or why is the regular CPI going up? And Well, we know it's because of food and energy, but what will cause it to go down? Well, here is a great chart. I've taken the consumer price index and inverted the trade weighted dollar index. Because if you think about it for a second, you know, what affects the price of food and energy? Yeah, the dollar, right? When the dollar's weak, what happens to energy prices? They go up. And what happens to food prices? Because we're the reserve currency. When the dollar goes down, uh, they go up, right? And then by when the dollar goes up, boom, they both go down. So if that is true, then we should see that in chart. Now, again, this is not perfectly correlated, but you can see the relationship is very, very strong. That when the dollar, shown inverted, goes down, down, well, inflation, uh, let's see, we see them following each other here. So the dollar, yeah, dollar is going down and consumer prices going up, dollar goes, yes, it's about, I, I have trouble sometimes looking at these charts backwards, but you can see that how this relationship follows each other. And now the dollar is rolling over and headed higher or starting to head higher. And what would that mean to the consumer price index? 
Well, it means it's going to go lower. So a rising dollar, lower consumer prices. And so if, you, if, if you're out there and you believe consumer prices are going up due to the effects of stimulus and all that, the real driver, the real driver of this is the dollar and the Fed. All right, let's move on to, uh, let's see, what do we have? Consumer price, real earnings, we did that. Uh, oils, now, the, the crude oil stuff is gonna be out of whack for a while. Just keep in mind there was a 13.8 million build, uh, but there was, a, let's say, over 17 million draw of product. So given you have almost one-to-one -one relationship, the market you know, said, hey, this is okay. But keep in mind, higher crude prices right? Where are they going to have a negative impact, you know, on the weekly retail sales? And think about this, you know, when people go back to work or as the economy reopens, right, what are they going to have to start doing? Driving to work. And that's going to mean money out of their pocket that when their car is sitting at home in the garage or wherever that's at, and they're not driving around, they have extra money to spend on other stuff. So now you're starting to see this big picture of there isn't enough money, there is a liquidity trap. And for every reaction, and prices up, there's got to be an equal negative reaction down. All right, so what do we have next on the list here for today? We have, oh yes, the 10-year treasury note auction. How could we forget about the tens? And you know what? Demand was just fine. Primary dealers bid a little bit extra. Foreign bidders bid a little bit less. And the bid to cover was spot on as six month average, no changes. This was a nice auction. We didn't get the zero bid on the low yield, but there really wouldn't, wasn't a need. Uh, there wasn't that kind of demand for, uh, you know, there's a plenty of margin there, but overall solid auction. Tomorrow is the 30 year. And tomorrow we also get the renewal of quantitative easing schedule, uh, which tomorrow is a day off from QE. So what do we got left on things to talk about? And I think let's go look at a chart of the dollar. Since we've been talking about the dollar, let's go take a look at it and say, is the dollar bottoming? Well, of course, we got a bond chart up. You can't blame me on that. Let's go to the dollar. And here you can see the dollar is has come down, is cross this moving, the 50-day moving average, it found support on the 50-day. It's bouncing off resistance here at 92. Does that mean it comes down and hits one of its prior moving averages? It could. And the next likely destination for the dollar is up here at 94, whether it goes down and confirms and moves up. But I want you to look at this weekly chart. And I want you to point out that once the dollar gets going above, say, 92, it should move very quickly into 94. So it moves through the supply zone fairly quickly. So it's going to run right into you know where it's uh, 50 week moving averages or uh, just a little above this 200 day moving average. But once the dollar gets going here, uh, and then after 94, well, here's where it gets really interesting because after 94, it zips right up into this 96.50. So you see how fast it moves because there's not a lot of shares traded in there. Uh, it, did, it didn't move quickly prior here, but when it sold through. So expect the dollar to move potentially fairly quickly once it gets some legs up to 96. That will kill off the headline CPI number and put it into all of this reflation notion. And that, of course, will be mega bond bullish. Anyways, I'm your host, T. Van Meter. As always, appreciate you watching. Be sure to like, be sure to subscribe. About to go and visit my friend, JB, Johnny Bravo. So be sure to tune into his show a little bit later. We'll be talking about gold, of all things. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'll see you on Friday for the Macro Show. Bye now. The content of this video is provided as education, educational information only is not intended to provide investor or other advice. Serials not to be construed as recognition or solicitation by a security financial instrument or to participate in particular training strategies. Serials as paired by Steam Van Meter. Personal capacity, opinions expressed in the field that do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advising or Steam Van Meter Financial.